Okay, so watching the clock, I won't go over 15 minutes, I promise, and then uh, talk to Kathy and Reed, and maybe after her talk, we'll take questions, so I'll kind of move things along. Also, that way, if you give me a tough question, I can just let her answer it. <laughs> All right, very good. Um, I want to thank uh, Mitchell Laverde, I know he's long gone, but uh, I want to thank him for, for his emphasis, allowing us to have the emphasis on, on our food program, which I'll talk about. We really can't put so much energy in, in one program without the bishops blessing and endorsement, but he thinks this area is so important, as you can tell today, both from his homily and his talk on that. So I want to thank him for that. I also want to thank Father Pollard for his for being such a great host here, and also Father Ferguson, the busiest priest I know, the busiest person I know. Here he is still, even hanging in there. So thank you, Father, for, for all your, your support uh, through all that we do. I also want to thank Father Creed. You know, Father Creed was the executive director of Catholic Charities back in the day, and, uh, you know, I was thinking... And I have a hunch, Father, you pick, the, you pick the readings for the Mass at this thing, or is it just always a coincidence that they're radically oriented towards the poor? But um, on, that, on the uh, first reading by St. Paul, where St. Paul says about, if the, if you will be a reaper depending on what you sow, and if, if there is any good movement in Catholic charities, if there's anything happening in our diocese that's, that's positive or good, really, Father Creed was there at the very beginning, planting those seeds, so if anything has developed, Father, I want to thank you for, for all your work and your priority. also want to say, Father Creed was very happy to give me advice. Sometimes I don't even have to ask for it uh, about how we should do things. So I, I really appreciate your mentoring, as well as your leadership and the foundation you've set for Catholic Charities. I also want to thank the Board of Directors of the Diocesan Peace and Justice Commission for letting me and Catholic Charities come here and talk today, and of course, Corinne, also for her work. Um, I do want to take at least a little bit more of my time. I'm watching the 15 minutes, don't worry. To thank some more people, uh, I want to thank uh, Reverend Beckman. It was a great talk, extremely inspiring and impossible to follow. And that's the way it goes. I also want to, this is a great opportunity to meet, meet with you, Kathy, and, and the work that you've done, too. I want to point out some of our staff that are here, because there's some of them are much closer to the things I'm going to talk about than I am. And, and also, they're just great colleagues. Uh, Sherry Longhill, Sherry, don't mind standing up. She runs our food program, the St. Lucie Project. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And, uh, just to be candid, you know, you have all these dreams and ideas of expanding, but you really can't do it without leadership, without somebody who can give you the confidence that you can go out and about throughout this large diocese, and Sherry's, Sherry's that person. Another colleague of mine, Jeff Rostand, our CFO, Jeff, you don't mind standing up too. Uh, Jeff is, watches the resources uh, very carefully um, and, and is a great colleague on working uh, with different issues and stuff, and a um, great leader as well. Then we have also Carla Walsh from uh, CCHDTRS. Carla, is still here? She's right over there somewhere. Okay, she's over there. Anyhow, Carla's here. So these are, these are yeah, that's right, a wave of applause could go into there. Um, these are key leaders of Catholic Charities, and I really appreciate their being here on, on, on a weekend. They love to be here and, and, and to help us through all the stuff we're trying to do. The, the, the task was to talk about the needs the root causes and the solution, and I think uh, Reverend Beckman pretty much nailed all that and gave us tremendous hope on that. I'm going to try to talk a little bit maybe specifically about the needs, root causes, and I think solutions for, for our diocese, uh, kind of take a more of a micro, micro approach in some way. You know, we are one of the wealthiest, we are 21 counties and seven cities, like my father said, we go all the way down, the farther south of Rappahannock County, all the way down to the northern neck. Which, by the way, I'm probably going to go to our booth back there and take a look at that template of kind of food insecurity for our diocese. And you'll see if that southeast, it's all red. It is one of the most challenging parts of the whole diocese. It's way far away from here. So, so the action, a lot of the action is out and about. But if you take a look at that map, it'll kind of give you a nice perspective of where some hot spots are in terms of food insecurity. But just to be clear, you see those, I think, that we're reflecting on it really strategically for Catholic Charities, how we can get more action to those places. The truth be told, in every county, in every area, there are people that we know, or people that, that are close to us that are having to argue, that are food insecure and, and really have a trouble budgeting, particularly as, as Reverend Beckman said, at the end of the month, making very hard choices about what they can and can't do. But uh, take a look at the map, too, because one of our, our jobs is to get stuff out and about. You also might be interested to know, in terms of the situation, that 20... Is it 22 parishes, Sherry? I'm looking at Sherry. 21 parishes. 21 parishes in our diocese, and this is one of them. Where the pastor not only gets up in the morning and says, oh, who sang that? Who 
who's going to cover the confession, and we got this group talking, and that group talking, and how's that Bible group going, and how's that Bible group going, and this problem, that problem. Another thing that 21 of our pastors wake up every day and worry, concern themselves about, is that they have a food pantry right on the parish campus. And they have people coming that day or the next day, going to be lining up and getting food. It's a case in Dale City and Holy Family. I was at All Saints yesterday. I happened to be there on that day, kind of working my way through the crowd of people lined up outside on the campus of All Saints. So about a third of our pastors not only face this every week, they manage it. They got executed. In fact, here, this is one of the parishes that perhaps is right in the heart of that. In fact, Obaldo, where is Obaldo? I saw you here. Where are you? And there he is right there. Why don't you stand up? He's the man here. He's the man here. <laughs> so we are a wealthy diocese, but also times, as you know, if you read the literature, it's not the problem of wealth and lack of wealth. It's the, it's the rising, growing disparity between those that have and don't have. So having people that have, and we are a diocese that has people that have, doesn't mean necessarily that people are on the bottom end being taken care of. In fact, sometimes the first step is so raised so high that people can fall sort of through the cracks. So 50% of the people in our diocese, excuse me, the Commonwealth, uh, make over $100,000 a year. 50% over 100K. Though we all know people that make 100K, they're still struggling. It's not even enough in this diocese, but that's a lot. That's a lot of gifts. But 25% of those, of those people make less than 25, 25%. Not 100K. 25% make less than 25,000 annually, and they're the ones that are really in trouble, unable, unable to adequately satisfy their basic needs: housing, food, transportation. The insecurity that people talk about. Now, there's been a lot of criticism in the press lately about this insecurity stuff. Uh, what uh, Wall Street Journal, Washington Times, and stuff kind of go in. And it's interesting to reflect on what they're saying. They're just. I think we have to caution ourselves that it's not starvation, but it's a real problem. You have to make a choice between kids' shoes, backpacks, and things like that. And that is something that is present throughout our diocese. Now, what are the root? So we have trouble in our diocese. It's kind of ironic. Where there are jobs, there might be a little less trouble. But where there's a lot of, a lot of people in food insecure, it's in the rural counties. The rural counties tend not to have as many jobs. In fact, even less jobs. And our root cause is, well, the discussion by um, Reverend Beckman was fascinating, particularly the four-legged table. I can speak for myself. Personal responsibility, strong economy, charities, and government. I'll talk a little bit about that, but I think I think one of the virtues of the Catholic perspective on poverty, the Catholic view on it, it is that it is complicated. That there are aspects of what we might call, let's say, the left. When the left look at things, people like William Julius Wilson at Harvard, great figures like him, the Catholic Church agrees with a lot of that. There are a lot of factors that cause inequality in our, in our, in our culture make it very difficult. He mentioned the prison system and, and, and how that's getting everyone's attention because it's so uncommonly tilted towards the poor. So that's a factor. Then there are conservatives out there who are saying, well, there's cultural changes that need to occur and there's bad public policy. And I think that in many ways the Catholic Church agrees with that too. Yeah, there are some policy that need to change. There are some things culturally we need to change as well. But I think there's a third factor, and I think this might even come under the, the area of charities that uh, uh, Robert Beckman mentioned. And this is a factor that is talked about by a sociologist at UVA, Brad Wilcox. He calls it the third factor. He calls it the decline of civil society, which has left American adults and families, particularly the less educated, detached from communities and detached from mutual aid. What he's noticed about the poor recently this relates directly to us, to us, to the Catholic Church, all churches really, is the poor are no longer going to church like they used to. I got talked to a priest recently, he goes, what are you talking about? I mean, I would assume that the poor would have been the heart, the heart and soul of Catholic, Catholic teaching and Catholic parishes forever. I said, not, I said, perhaps, at least the indications are the poor are not going to church. They're not getting involved in churches. This is not just a Catholic thing. This is a Christian thing, but it's not even just a Christian thing. The poor are not going to churches as much as they used to, and, and this is alarming. Why is it alarming? Because we don't get our numbers up? No, well, well that'd be part of it. No, it's alarming because when you're in a parish, in a church community, not only the spiritual feeding, but also the social feeding. Like, are you doing okay? Are you doing all right? That kind of stuff. The poor are opting out of that. Now you can say, well, what's with the churches? Why aren't we more inviting? Fair question to ask. Fair question to ask. Why are they choosing? not to be involved in the parishes and churches. I think this is a call to conscience for us. Are we putting the right drawbridges down? Are we being accessible enough to encourage people
people to come to our churches to have their needs met. Well, of course, some of their needs are spiritual, but their needs are also um, fundamental in terms of food and things like that as well. So that's another factor, I think, that, that, that we at Catholic Charities and we as Catholics and Christians need to face and knowing how many parishes spend so much time giving out food on the parish campus. I don't know if the, I don't know, I don't know if the pastors are also talking about that as much as maybe some of us, particularly us in the middle class, need to hear or not. What about, what about this, so, so what about that, the church is being seen as a fundamental place where the poor can go and continue to go, but we have a crisis now where they're not coming to that. The other thing the poor are not coming to is marriage. The poor are marrying much less than they ever have. And, 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 and often maybe for, for single moms raising families and dads say, hey, I don't think so, I don't think I need to commit to this, I'm off to the next venture or whatever. This is horrible for the poor. And so marriage is kind of falling out of favor, churches and religion are falling out of favor, and this is another thing really that the poor don't have that makes life more rewarding and interesting. Our Holy Father has a solution to some of this, but I want to, I want to kind of give a hard saying from the Bible. I can probably because I'm melancholic, I like hard sayings, but here it is from James, 2 James 16. And one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body. What good is that? What good is that if you haven't taken care of the physical needs of people and you're preaching, preaching, preaching? This is something that I think we have to kind of get our arms around, of the primacy of helping people. And really the term for this is solidarity. I don't know about you, I, uh, that's funny how God works with me, I'm such a knucklehead. He had me go to a Jesuit high school, I still didn't get it. He had me go to a Jesuit college, I still didn't get it. He had me go to a Jesuit, Jesuit graduate school, I still didn't get it. But now he's got a Jesuit pope, I'm starting to get it. I'm starting to get it. So, and what, 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 is, what was probably discussed in all those Jesuit classes I had was solidarity. So later on I read Dos de Esti, I read his book, Good Brothers Karmatsov, and you might those who read it, you might remember the father of Zosima. He comes early in the book of Midway, the book, because he's, he gives this dying speech, but it's so good, he stays alive and gives it again, as Bill C.S. who was paid by the, by the word, intended to do it. So Father Zosima said the following, so Father Zosima is a monk, a uh, Russian Orthodox monk. Here's what he said. We are all responsible for everybody. We are all responsible for everyone. I heard that, and I go, well, you know, there's a lot of crazy people in Dostoevsky novels. Maybe he's one of them. So I asked a couple of priests and stuff, okay, Bennett, this is basic Christian thinking. Where have you been? <laughs> I don't know, I've been running right Catholic charity. They kind of say, don't have to think about this stuff or whatever. So, so anyhow, so we are all responsible for everyone. This is fundamental Christian thinking, and it's called sol solidarity. I think this is a bit lost in our faith. I think we're worrying about other stuff. We've got other stuff to worry about. I'm not minimizing that. But is this, a, is this something that all of us are thinking about all the time? I am responsible for everybody around the world. That's why we pray for them. And certainly I'm responsible for those closest to me. And we have to reawaken this in our Catholic churches, in our, in our, I guess I'll spot at the Catholic churches. Not to say it's not out there, but we need to make it more overt, more necessary. Now what is this, what is this solidarity? What's the fundament, foundation of the solidarity? Well, we see things differently as Christians. We literally see things differently. You heard Reverend Beckman talk. He sees the world differently. He sees, by the way, a lot of hope. He sees the worst, and he comes and he sees with hope. What's that all about? It's a Christian perspective. We see people, even those people, like you mentioned, who disappoint us, use too many drugs or whatever, as inherent with inherent dignity. We see them as intrinsically social. That is, they're going to grow or they're going to decline by their interactions with others. That's why people not coming to churches is so alarming, because it's such a great social. We see them equal in dignity, and we see them on a path towards unity and brotherhood. That's how Christians are supposed to see people, and, and how we're supposed to act. What is, what is this moral virtue of solidarity? It's not a feeling of vague compassion, or shallow distress at the, at the misfortunes of so many. That ain't gonna make it. Oh, I have a little bit of vague compassion. Oh, a little distressed how things are going. That ain't going to make it. We have to actually walk the talk and really commit to the common good. Now, just one, one or two minutes. I've probably gone over. But I'm only one or two minutes. Watch how fast I can talk. I want to talk about our St. Lucy Project. Our St. Lucy Project is a, probably the highest priority of Catholic Charities right now. But we're
we're trying to get food out and about where it's needed. One of the advantages of Catholic Charities, we don't just deal with the west end of Fairfax County, we don't just deal with this part of Prince William County, we can go wherever we want, wherever the need is greatest. The other advantage of Catholic Charities, we have not only Catholic churches, radically generous by and large, but also other churches that can give us food. We can bring it to Page County if it needs to go to Page County, we can bring it to Kilmarnock if it needs to, we can bring it to Alexander or whatever. To do this, we've got now three hubs with three pantries, Catholic Charities pantries, working with all these parishes as well. Christ House in Alexandria, Christ House in Alexandria, which Father, back in the day, created what great rewards from there. That little root cellar basement where you hit your head every time you go down there, um, still stores food as a drop-off place. We also have it in Leesburg. Why do you have a food pantry in Leesburg? What's that all about? There's four people in Leesburg. Here's our pantry. There's the forest people living in the forest. That happens in Leesburg. It happens in Loudoun County. And then the third one is in Front Royal, Virginia, where our food pantry, as in Leesburg, is kind of so overrun with people, we've had to move. We've had to move to bigger digs so we can help more people. And then the, the coup de grace of the St. Lucie Project is we're going to open a hub in Manassas, VA, strategically kind of in the middle of things, rents a little less, tremendous support of all saints and other parishes, including Holy Family. We're counting on it. We're counting on it. And at that big hub, 5,000 square feet of food, it's not only going to have food, it's going to have refrigeration to kind of attack the problem. Reverend Beckman talked about it, others talk about it all the time. Unhealthy food for the poor is to give them healthy food. St. John Neumann, rest in Virginia, gave us a, a refrigerated truck. What about that? There's some Catholic muscle for you. Give us a refrigerated truck so we can get fresh food to people. Boom, they do it. So I want to tell you there is indeed hope. You get more information on the St. Lucie Project back there. Grab a blue bag. They're pretty cool. They're pretty cool. Save your money to the supermarket. They have a blue bag. Get your fellow parishioners to get involved in this too. When we serve the poor, we encounter Christ. He's in the Eucharist. Thank God for that, literally. He's right here with us now. But when we see our poor brothers and sisters, that's the direct encounter with Christ. Thank you very much. God bless.